Welcome to today's presentation of Tribal Practice, Perspectives from Tribal Judges and Practitioners. First, some general housekeeping announcements. Today's webinar is being recorded and the link to the recording will be shared via email following the event. We have live auto captioning enabled. Please click on the live transcript feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen to view or hide these captions throughout today's discussion. We will reserve time at the end to address questions submitted via the Q&A feature found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So when we first started talking about the idea of an Indian law focused CLE, we decided rather to discuss the Marshall Trilogy, the Indian Civil Rights Act, or the McGirt case and its impact on Indian country as a whole, we decided it might be just as informative and maybe more interesting to provide practitioners perspectives on their expertise and experience in working in Indian country. We deliver this from three different perspectives. First is Sarah Van Norman. She's a lawyer from a boutique firm with a client base that includes Indian tribes and tribal entities. Sarah is the founder of Van Norman Law in Minneapolis. She's been in private practice for 17 years, working almost exclusively in Indian country. Sarah handles diverse business construction, environmental and regulatory matters for tribes and people doing business with them. She also represents tribal governments in matters involving treaty rights, governance, elections, intergovernmental relations and more. She has worked with and for over 50 nationally recognized tribes. And in addition, she is a mediator and AAA arbitrator and a former tribal court judge for the system Wapadan Oyate in South Dakota. More information about Sarah and Van Norman Law is available online at svn.legal.com. Secondly, we have Dennis Puzz. He's an in-house tribal attorney whose full-time job is to represent his only client, a sovereign Indian nation. Dennis is a member of the Yurok tribe and has been fortunate enough to fill various positions serving tribes throughout his career from executive director to outside counsel to in-house counsel with multiple tribes. Currently, Dennis is general counsel for the Stockbridge Muncie Indian community. And finally, we have Vanya Hogan, a perspective from the bench provided by a judge who has provided over countless trials and court cases in tribal jurisdiction. Vanya is an enrolled member of the Guala Sioux tribe, grew up just a few miles north of her tribe's Pine Ridge Reservation in Western South Dakota. She has practiced Indian law for more than 25 years in a variety of private practice settings, including as a partner at a firm then known as Fragrant Benson, and currently in the firm she co-founded, Hogan Adams. Vanya represents tribal governments and their business partners in both litigation trans and transactions. She is a nas she's nationally recognized for her work. She has also served as a tribal court judge for the Shakopee Midwakanen Sioux community for 14 years. So as we get through this, please feel free to ask questions in the chat panel. We will answer them at the end of this session. And also please indicate if your question is intended for a specific member of the panel. With that, I'll kick things off with Sarah. Thanks so much, RJ. Um, I count it as a great success that I managed to unmute myself appropriately for the talk. Um, and I think I've got about 10 minutes. So if I'm incorrect or if I'm going on too long, please let me know um, and I will adjust accordingly. Um, it is, I have to say, so interesting to be here with this panel today and, of course, speaking um, uh, through the U of M Law School, uh, where I went and graduated some years ago, um, I really was reflecting on um, the fact that uh, of the relationships between all of the people on this panel and uh, what that says about the tribal bar itself and about practicing Indian law. Um, it, I've, uh, amongst the people on this panel are folks that I went to school with, that I attended Indian law programming with in law school where we had to, um, you know, find our ways inexpensively to travel, um, to go to what we all call Fed Bar, which is the Federal Bar Association's Indian law conference every year. And it's kind of a, a major gathering point uh, for folks from across the country doing this work. Um, you know, some of us went on to work together, um, it, you know, whether as somebody representing a client or um, being the client, um, I've worked as outside counsel to tribes throughout my practice. Um, and that's meant I've had the privilege of doing work with RJ or excuse me with uh, Dennis um, in his capacity as in-house counsel. 
Um, and uh, that that's certainly been a rich experience and, and, and enjoyable to have colleagues and friends in those roles as we all mature in our practices together. Um, and of course, Danny and I had worked together at Fagri as well as another Indian law firm. And I um, owe whatever writing skill I have, uh, probably to Danya's uh, excellent uh, direction. Um, and I uh, also have, you know, even very recently gotten to work with RJ, another classmate of mine, um, on a project that was just so, I think, emblematic of. Uh, a lot of what we do um, when we're working for tribes um, and doing transactional work I, and the, the rich issues that come up in that context. Um, so I thought that might be a helpful kind of, um, kind of example to start with um, of what I do um, and what it means for me to, to practice. So I won't get into too many specifics, but um, I was uh, working with RJ through his current role um, indirectly, but um, coordinating um, where his organization was lending money um, and granting money as well to a tribe that wanted to um, build a butcher shop or acquire a butcher shop and related operations. And um, I was asked and the, the tribe hired me to represent them in the transaction, just a what was a fairly simple purchase by, but by a tribal entity um, from a private entity. And um, it was a project that I, like many um, that we see in Indian country, I think took longer um, than it would have outside Indian country because there are always different issues to navigate. We have to talk about um, if we have a dispute, where is it gonna be and how is it gonna be handled? Um, you know, are we going to be in tribal court? Are we going to find a way to be in state court if we have a dispute? Are we going to uh, go to arbitration or mediation, which as you heard from my introduction, those are things that I, I sit in a different, different chair oftentimes to, to handle. Um, I'm actually helping others um, in what I like to think of broadly as a, a peacemaking if I you know if we're in 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 the if I get to control um any aspect of the setting um that's the 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 um kind of mindset I bring to it but um we have to talk about disputes at the very beginning almost always when we have a transaction um in Indian country so it does change um how how some of those those deals go uh this particular project um was really satisfying. It was an operation that meant a lot to this particular tribe um, that meant uh, and intersected with cultural values, food sovereignty, access, um, you know, a number of different things really came together in what otherwise might just be a simple business transaction. Um, and um, uh, the support of RJ's organization made it all possible. So um, that was an example. That's, you know, just an example of one of the kinds of things um, that I've handled recently. It, in terms of practice areas, that touched on aspects of real estate law, interjurisdictional practice. Um, I'm barred in Minnesota, and this was uh, a matter happening in another state. Um, so navigating that is also something that, that comes along sometimes with our Indian country work. Um, it also involved just straight up business transaction, transactional standards, drafting contracts, um, navigating some tribal um, decision making processes, getting approval from the tribal governing body for the acquisition. Um, and then, you know, which licenses would be needed to operate, um, what else would be needed to keep the business going. Oh, we've got to make sure folks have, have all of the resources in this new business area that they're, they're going to be in. And that's one of the great things. And I'm, I'm interested to hear what other folks have to say on the panel too. But I think it's honestly one of my very favorite things about Indian law practice um, you're frequently advising and counseling on areas that go beyond just straight law practice. Um, a lot of tribal attorneys, including outside counsel, get to play a role of helping shape um, decision making a little bit differently than um, if you're simply in a more arm's length kind of setting or just a project by project basis. 
um, if that's the way that your work as an attorney goes. So um, that's just one window. Um, where do I come from? I'm also from South Dakota. I grew up in Rapid City. Um, I, um, my, I am not native myself. I'm not a uh, tribal descendant. Um, I've simply been around and lived in native places. This is a native place, uh, like everywhere else in the United States. Um, and, uh, my, I grew up seeing my folks work with native people in different ways. Um, and I was the kid of an attorney. So that practice or the concept of law practice as work um, helped lead me along. Um, when I went to law school at the U of M, um, I had a particularly good professor and there was a great program at that time that RJ and Dennis also came through. Um, uh, and uh, he really helped um, guide a number of us, I think, um, as we decided how to make a career in this area. And um, what that meant was taking classes. It meant uh, participating. I believe the ICWA clinic is still part of the U of M. Um, really excellent practice opportunities um, through there and understanding and direct involvement with um, Native folks needing representation in the Twin Cities. Um, working on articles, uh, attending conferences, uh, doing any a number of things that are available and possible um, still today at the U of M. Um, and then when I came out of law school, I actually did something totally different because it's not, uh, this is not a huge private bar. Um, there are only so many Indian law practitioners in this community. Um, and uh, while it's obviously an important and interesting area, um, that's always a consideration. So I came out of law school and was lucky enough to get a position as an associate in uh, the construction law practice at Fagri at that time. And I did that for several years doing as much Indian law work as I could, um, and also hoping to find a, my path to simply practicing um, in and primarily for tribes. Um, and that happened and I got to go and practice for almost 10 years and become a law partner um, at an Indian law firm called Jacobson Law Group in St. Paul. And um, that's really where I got to learn the things that I know um, and, um, ultimately decided to go into my own practice and um, start to emphasize particularly those neutral jobs, the mediator, arbitrator roles, as well as um, maintain my own client relationships with both tribes and non-tribal folks. Um, I uh, want to note one other thing before I, I see if my, my time is up, because it probably is, um, that construction law work. Um, that was kind of a, a something that I, I backed into. I didn't know that that would end up being so important to my tribal practice, uh, but it certainly has been a cornerstone. Um, because I started in that practice, and that's the work that I was lucky enough to get then, and that the training I was able to get, today I do a lot of tribal construction work. Um, I work, um, I prepare contracts, I help negotiate, um, and I do what I would argue is really a lot of the time um, cultural competency work, um, helping um, non-tribal vendors do work for tribes um, and trying to bridge and connect people and navigate through um, tribal systems um, and um, maintaining always an understanding of and frankly a personal commitment in my practice to the preservation of tribal sovereignty and culture. So um, those are those are uh, kind of the, the the very high level ways in which I do this work and why I do it. Um, I absolutely love working in Indian country and um, am am uh, am delighted with the diversity um, of work that I get to do um, and to to you know continue in it is is my hope. So I think that might've been my time, RJ. Is there anything else that you think that I should cover right now or should I gracefully allow the next person to go forward? I think that's good. I think uh, we'll, we'll have a question and answer period at the end where we may mm -hmm. hear from you again, but um, sure. uh, we can turn it over to Dennis. 
Thank you. All right, first test, video on, mic working. Uh, good afternoon. Hello to all my fellow alumnus out there that may be viewing our webinar. And thank you, U of M, for inviting me today. And uh, it's great to be on the panel with my fellow alumni. I'm going to try to share my screen now. I do have a PowerPoint uh, to share. All right. So this is sort of my discussion with you about what it's like to practice successfully uh, in Indian country from an in-house council perspective. Right. So my background, which flavors my viewpoint that I'm sharing with you today is I am a Yurok tribal member. Um, I did go home and was executive director, uh, third ever for my tribe. Um, which in our structure meant that I was um, who all the directors, outside counsel and um, consultants reported to, and I reported directly to the uh, tribal council. Um, it was an amazing job that really gave me a um, broad perspective on um, all the things tribal governments do, how they operate uh, internally, all the different divisions and all the different work they do and gave me a um, jump start into intergovernmental relations as well. Um, I traveled with the council with uh, compact negotiations with the Schwarzenegger administration and also um, discussions with the federal government on various issues. So it was a great um, jump start to my career very early. I was also a member of a mid-sized law firm in their Indian law practice group. Um, I think that was critical. It gave me a lot of research skills and writing skills from veteran attorneys, exposure to multiple clients. And it also helps me, I think, be a better in-house counsel when I partner with my outside counsel um, because I understand the pressures they're under, how law firms work, um, how billing works, and all those pieces of their internal machinery so I can help them be successful while they're helping me be successful. And it's a win-win for both of us. Um, I've also been in-house counsel at Mille Lacs Band's Corporate Commission, which I know they go by um, Corporate Ventures now, I believe, as their name. Um, worked for Forest County Potawatomi Community in-house out of their Milwaukee office. And then now with the Stockbridge Muncie community. First thing that I think is critical is knowing your client. Um, that's always important whether you're outside counsel or in-house, but particularly when you're in-house, um, it is critical because every tribe is different. And if you try to apply a cookie cutter approach and just do the same thing with each tribal client, um, you're gonna run into tension and issues because the same solution doesn't work for every tribe. Um, getting to know their history, is important because it flavors how they think, how they operate, and their governmental structure. Um, for example, Stockbridge Muncie community that I now serve um, was an East Coast tribe and early on decided to adopt Christianity, uh, adopt formal education, to learn how the new colonists operate and found that as their path forward to succeed and survive. And that is flavored how they operate as a tribe and how they structure their tribal government, um, their belief in formal uh, Christian religion and the role it plays within their government and within their culture. And it's an important difference um, and something you need to be aware of. Their governmental history. Um, key piece for them is a governmental issue in the 90s where membership actually took over the government over disagreements about how the government was operating that resulted in a lot of the ordinance structure protecting uh, worker rights and formalizing how the tribal council operates down to what days of the month it meets, that it meets at a certain building, and how it functions with its uh, agenda being visible to membership and membership participation in those meetings. 
So those are all key components of how the government works that is rooted in its history and its culture. And you need to know that because if you're going to touch chapter 53, employment rights, or chapter 54, preference, or um, chapter 50, the uh, procedures ordinance, those were all documents that started from that 90s takeover of the tribal government and a rebalancing of roles, responsibilities, and rights that is deeply ingrained in the culture and are fairly sacred. So you have to tread lightly and be careful if you touch those documents. And if you don't know the history, you wouldn't know that and you might get yourself into hot water with the community and with your elected leadership by trying to make radical changes to those ordinances um, without proper input and uh, relationship building. And that also leads into the legal history, um, knowing the different treaties, the different reservations that they may have, your client may have had over time and how that all plays in is also important um, because there may be interpretations of how things work that doesn't necessarily match with your read of the exact language in an ordinance, but they may have had a history of doing that um, for a long period of time. Uh, for example, my client, the president typically doesn't vote. The ordinance allows the president to vote on every item, but they usually only cast their vote to break ties. If you don't learn the legal history and the interpretation of how they've been operating, you wouldn't know that just by reading the document. My experience in Indian country has been that it's a relationship transaction model. So when you first start with your client, you first get hired, tread lightly. Uh, the tribe has operated for hundreds of years before you and will operate for hundreds of years after you. Um, you have an important role to play as legal counsel, but the tribe isn't functioning just because of you or doesn't need you to function. So learn your role, build relationships, learn how things are functioning now and become part of the community before you start implementing changes or um, giving critiques of the current system. It can be hard for us. Most of us attorneys are type A linear logical thinkers and we apply that um, to our functioning both professionally and probably in our personal lives. Not everybody we interact with within the tribal government thinks that way or approaches items that way. So sometimes it's helpful to kind of downshift, sit back, take in the atmosphere, listen to others before offering your opinion or offering your advice. Um, and be patient. Uh, oftentimes when people enter tribal practice and they're starting their first big project, I tell them, think about what is a very comfortable, casual timeline for your project and double it. And that will probably be aggressive um, to get accomplished. So sit back, be patient and allow the process to work. Don't try to drive it um, too aggressively or you will end up alienating some of the relationships you need to function well. And then this is an, another piece that I think is important for in-house counsel, no matter where you're at, but especially in Indian country, when you're answering to elected officials, your job is to find a route to yes, if at all possible. Listen to what your client wants to achieve. And if the route they're suggesting to get there isn't one you would recommend or isn't lawful, uh, because of different policies, procedures, or ordinances, tell them you understand where they want to go. Let them know you'll help them get there, but that you just need to take a little bit of a different path. Um, they'll often soften and allow a different path to get to their ultimate goal if you're careful in how you approach it and that you remind them that you agree and understand that they control the direction you're not trying to change the direction. You're just changing the path on how to get there. However, there are going to be times where what your client wants to do is just not possible, um, either due to uh, the ordinance structure or policy and procedures. And at those times, you do have to say no. And hopefully you've found enough creative ways to get to yes, that when you have to say no, uh, it's not 
damaging to the relationship and your client will value that input, know that you say yes whenever possible and accept that answer. Know your role. Um, tribes operate very differently. Um, so know your role within the tribal organization. Um, some tribes I've worked for lean heavily on legal to do a lot of uh, tasks that are outside of the usual legal sphere. Um, many times the legal department is a high functioning, highly efficient and productive department. So when things need to get done quickly or are very technical, many times the client will lean on the legal department to lead that task or to do the task, um, even though it's not something you would normally associate with a legal department. Um, others don't want a perception from the community or membership that the legal department is running the tribe. Um, so you have to be careful to be quiet um, in public meetings in those instances and only offer your advice when you're asked for it. Um, you don't want to put your bosses in a bad position, your elected tribal council, by appearing like you're running the meeting or that you're uh, talking over them or directing how things are going to run um, because that's not how that tribe operates. Within your department, uh, know your role. Are you largely contract review? Are you there to help uh, administer the department and figure out how you can provide the best value to your teammates within the department? And that will make for a much better working experience. And then with the larger tribal communities your client operates in, know your role. Um, there's the Great Lakes Intertribal Council here in uh, Wisconsin that a lot of tribes participate in. There's the Midwest Area Sovereign Tribes, MAST. When your client participates in those activities and asks for your assistance, know your role and be aware of your ethical responsibilities and who's your client. Because many times these organizations don't have much in-house counsel, if at all, and they tend to rely on the counsel of their participants to assist. And that can be dangerous from an ethical perspective because you don't want to create a client relationship where one shouldn't exist. And then if in you're in a leadership position within your legal department, it's important to assess your team and to assess the team of the larger organization. Uh, know the strengths and weaknesses of the tribal organization as a whole and of your department. Um, a lot of times uh, the legal department is brought into the larger management group and are you're asked to participate with your management hat on um, rather than just your legal hat. And being able to assess the strengths and weaknesses of different departments assists in helping tribal council know who to task with certain roles and you to know as a legal department where you need to step up and help um, more with other departments to make sure you're ultimately reaching the goals of your client. And then within your department, set up your teammates for success. Give them the broad authority to own their uh, subject matter areas and practice in a way that's meaningful to them, but know that they're, you're there for them to support them and to give them the training they need, to give them the resources they need, and collectively get the tasks handled as a department. Um, and that's a big part of putting your client and your department where they can be successful. If you're getting into litigation, you have a small department, which most of us in-house are um, dealing with, know that you can't deal with extensive discovery on your own. Um, if you take it on, other things are gonna fall off the plate that are gonna be more harmful to your client than if you outsource with a good outside attorney or legal firm um, to handle that litigation. And you can monitor it, you can assist with it, but not be responsible for the uh, discovery and a lot of the briefing, which can eat up a lot of resources. So learn what you can handle in-house, what is more effective to send outside, and work on those relationships. Because when you build that trust with your outside counsel, they get to know your client better as well. You end up providing better services and everyone wins. Also, think broader about your partners. Lobbying firms, hugely um, helpful in getting things done at the state and federal government level. Um, PR firms, I think, are underutilized. Having a um, very visible client 
can often give you more political capital at uh, state and federal levels or even county levels. And a PR firm is great at doing that. And then part of being successful is having long-term relationships and being able to stay in a position um, for a number of years. And part of that is being aware of the politics but not getting involved in them. What does that mean? If you're reporting to elected officials, you need to be aware of the politics they're dealing with so you're not suggesting solutions that cannot be implemented for political reasons. Put your elected officials in good positions where they can be successful. Give them solutions that they can actually implement and use. But do not get involved in their political issues where you become a political topic. That is a sure way to eventually have your employment end. Stay focused on the issues. Um, there may be disagreements amongst the elected officials. That is theirs to figure out. You stay focused on the issue you are supposed to deal with as a staffer. And stay in your lane. Um, if you have a team of people dealing with an issue, the IT director, the HR director, the CFO are all part of this team. Make sure you stay in your lane and deal with your legal issues and assist when asked but don't try to run the project if it's not yours to run. And then be consistent and ethical in your approaches to all issues. There are gonna be times when you have to say no, or you have to make suggestions that are not what your client wants to hear. But if you stay consistent in your approach and you stay ethical in how you deal with ascertaining who's your client and what the ordinances state, and how you interpret them, uh, your advice will be respected and largely followed by your client. All right. That's my keys to success that I've uh, garnered over the years, and I'm happy that I got to share them with you and look forward to uh, Q&A interaction later in the uh, program. With no further ado, I'm handing off to uh, Banya to take up the presentation. All right. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you, RJ, for inviting me to present today. It's nice to get to present through the University of Minnesota. I graduated back in 1993, so I'm really the oldster of the bunch today. Um, and I want to give you my perspective as outside counsel to tribes um, and try not to overlap too much with what Sarah said. And then also as a tribal court judge, because I currently practice law um, most of the time, but I'm also a tribal court judge, which takes up about a fourth to a third of my time, uh, kind of ebbs and flows a little bit. So first, uh, talking about my role as outside counsel, um, over the years, I have uh, pretty much all my whole career has been representing tribes mostly, and then representing their business partners as well to some degree. I have worked in three different small law firms, including uh, my current firm, Hogan Adams, which we uh, I founded with some partners back in 2013. And then also at what was then Fagri and Benson, so one very large firm where I headed uh, the Indian law practice area there. And one of the things I love about my practice is that over the years, I've gotten to do just a really wide variety of things. Um, so I spend probably um, about equal amounts of time when you discount the, the judge work um, doing litigation and transactional work. And particularly when I was at Fagri, I was one of the very few people there who I think did both transactional and litigation work. Um, but it's, it keeps things interesting, and I do a wide variety of uh, transactions and litigation even within that working for tribes. So I've um, done work on treaty cases involving uh, reservation boundaries, just finished one up in the Seventh Circuit for the Oneida Nation, um, worked on tax cases for tribes where tribes are asserting their tax immunities against state taxes cases involving Indian gaming um, and uh, one piece of litigation that went on for seven years at uh, 
three different federal lawsuits, a tribal court lawsuit and a state court lawsuit involving a tribal bond deal that went uh, south. Fortunately, I wasn't one of the lawyers on the actual transaction. Uh, but I do also do transactional work, uh, help tribes um, on just kind of day-to-day -day contracting matters, but also um, on financings where tribes are sometimes building new casinos, sometimes expanding casinos, and then sometimes, you know, just typical governmental projects, um, housing projects and that kind of thing. And then the other kind of work that I get to do is governmental work for tribes, um, where you're actually working with tribal leaders, helping develop tribal laws and kind of answering day-to-day -day questions that come up in the running of a government. So it's rewarding practice in terms of getting to do a lot of different kinds of things. Most of the time when I'm working with tribes, they have in-house counsel like Dennis, and I um, am lucky enough to be working with Dennis on a, a project right now. Um, and so the relationship between outside counsel and in-house counsel with tribes is pretty similar uh, to what it is when you're working with an out, you know, with a in the corporate world where you're working with in-house counsel. The tribal in-house counsel can be very helpful to outside counsel in helping you avoid, um, kind of helping you protect yourself from stepping in it when it comes to tribal politics, as Dennis alluded to, and also from kind of cultural missteps. As Dennis pointed out, and I think Sarah said this too, tribal governments they're all very different. And so you may think you know what tribal governments are like, and then you start working for a new one where they do things completely differently. Um, there are some tribes where if you show up to a tribal council meeting and you're wearing a suit, you're gonna get a lot of crap given to you for you know, dressing like a typical lawyer. Then there are other tribal councils where you show up uh, dressed casually and they'll say, hey, why aren't you wearing a suit? We expect our lawyers to be wearing a suit. And that's just kind of one very minor example, but the culture it, it varies greatly. Um, so having an in-house counsel who can kind of give you a heads up about those things is very nice. And in not just about things like dress, but also about, as I said, tribal politics. So you could be sitting in a meeting and um, somebody's bringing up some issue that seems like it's just out of the blue um, and you can't understand why they keep raising this issue and the you know, uh, in-house counsel might alert you to the fact that, well, that those two people ran against each other in a tribal election 10 years ago and um, you know, they never agree on anything, or you might be asked to give uh, advice about whether the tribe should enter into a contract and in-house counsel will alert you that, by the way, just so you know, the tribal chairman's brother owns this company that we're considering contracting with. And of course, you don't change your advice based on that, but you might change the way you approach the topic um, just to be a little uh, perhaps less blunt than you might be if you didn't know that fact. I think Dennis's advice about knowing about tribal politics but staying out of it is absolutely uh, right on the money because as he says, if you get involved in political issues, start uh, taking one side or another, that is a good way to get bounced out of your position. And you'll see there are some lawyers who do bounce around from place to place because they get caught up um, get caught up in the politics and then other places you'll have a tribal attorney one of the tribes that i've worked with a lot is a tribe in michigan they've had the same uh, general counsel for 20 years which is a pretty remarkable feat in indian country well, most tribal governments, uh, in my experience, do have in-house counsel. There are some that don't. They're either small enough or they're in between uh, in-house counsel. But so you are, as the outside lawyer, representing the tribe without an in-house counsel as the buffer. And in those cases, you really do end up kind of acting as if you were a general counsel to them. You might be coming to a meeting to, you know, give a report on litigation, but 
some employment law issue comes up in the middle of the meeting and they're going to turn to you because you're the lawyer in the room. And so you kind of have to be on your toes for that kind of thing and for obvious you know, conflict issues that might just come up on the spur of the moment um, when there isn't, you know, when you're representing them across the board and not just on a particular uh, you know, transaction or piece of litigation. When I'm working with tribal governments, I always try to, um, with new tribal governments, approach the representation by doing some research to make sure that I understand the structure of the tribal government because they aren't all the same. Uh, some tribes are governed by a very small group of people, like a five member council. Um, other tribes have much larger tribal councils, like my tribe in South Dakota, where I think the number right now is 21. It always varies a little bit. Um, and then other tribes have, are governed by what's usually known as a general council, where it's the adult membership of the tribe. So it's more like a direct democracy. Um, and you really have to approach things with those kind of governments differently plan far in advance because uh, it can be very hard to get things through a general council meeting. But uh, whatever their structure is, you need to understand that as you approach the government um, and try to advise them. Particularly, well, I think it is particularly in transactional work, if you're dealing with a general council, that is going to slow down the transaction, especially if you know you have to get a waiver of sovereign immunity approved by the general counsel. Sometimes they only need a few times a year. So those are some considerations that you have to have in mind uh, working for tribal governments that you wouldn't necessarily uh, have to consider if you're representing a corporate client. Uh, kind of along the lines of tribes are all different, and Dennis mentioned this too, the, what works for one tribe may not work for another. Um, and they're just their value systems and cultural viewpoint may be different. One example uh, I was thinking about in preparing for today is that I represented a tribe here in Minnesota on helping them resolve some membership issues this was 20 years ago, I spent the first several years of my practice doing a lot of tribal enrollment litigation because the tribe was really had some internal battles over whether they should preserve a high blood quantum requirement or move to lineal descendancy. And, you know, eventually they did move to lineal descendancy and it took a lot of it took some administrative litigation against the Bureau of Indian Affairs and a lot of tribal court lawsuits, but finally they were able to put those issues behind them. And I recently got hired to represent a tribe dealing with some similar issues in another state. And uh, even with my knowledge that all tribes are different, I kind of had this thought in my head, well, I've been through this set of problems with the tribe before I can help guide them using that experience. And the experience is helpful, but they're what they view as the end goal to put their membership behind them is completely different from the tribe I worked with here in Minnesota. So you really, uh, it requires a lot of listening and getting to know your clients when you're working with uh, tribal governments. I want to just transition then and talk to you a little bit about my role as a tribal court judge. First, uh, it may seem unusual that someone is both a practicing lawyer and a judge at the same time. And it doesn't happen a lot in urban areas, but in rural areas, you sometimes will see that, you know, part-time municipal judges who also have um, private practice. So, uh, I'm on the bench at the Shakopee Metawakanton Sioux community here. And uh, early in my career, I was uh, outside counsel to the Shakopee community uh, at both when I worked at Fagri and at uh, another small firm. When I got appointed to the bench, I uh, left Fagri and Benson so that I wouldn't, uh, there wouldn't be a conflict between their representation of the community and me being on the bench. I, of course, do not ever practice law representing any client in the court where I'm a judge and I no longer represent the community. 
Uh, but I do practice in other tribal courts uh, as well as in state and federal courts on behalf of other tribal clients. It is a, has been a unique opportunity, I think, to get to be a judge at the same time I'm a lawyer and I really have enjoyed my time on the bench. I'm so grateful to have this opportunity. I feel like it's actually made me uh, a better lawyer because you just seeing that other perspective, I can really see things that as a judge uh, drive me crazy and uh, that than I, I know to avoid when I'm representing clients. Uh, likewise, I sometimes see people who do, you know, really effective advocacy and uh, can kind of use some of those techniques myself. The caseload out at Shakopee, just to give you a little information about it, is all civil cases, mostly family law, child protection and conservatorship proceedings. Um, and I don't really do a lot of those kind of cases in my practice. So it is a different area of the law. We have our own rules of civil procedure. Um, there's the community has its own substantive laws. So its own domestic relations code, uh, its own conservatorship ordinance that set the rules for those things. And uh, we have maybe I, I apologize if I just said that we have our own rules of civil procedure you have to be licensed to practice in the tribal court. And so for anybody, I would be remiss in talking at all about tribal courts without giving a couple uh, pointers, especially talking to an audience that's I, you know, probably not that familiar with practicing tribal courts. If you're gonna practice in tribal court, don't just assume that it is exactly the same as state court. Do not put state of Minnesota at the top um, and just use a state court caption because the tribal court will have its own way of doing things. Look at the rules and ask questions if you need to. And generally I would say you ought to treat tribal courts with the same kind of respect um, that you would for a state or federal court and prepare with the same diligence that you would for one of those courts. I think I'll wrap up there so that we have time for questions. I'll turn it back to RJ to moderate those. Thank you. <clears throat> nice job, everyone. Uh, appreciate it. Um, I have a question. Our first question is from Keith Rashad. And he says, first of all, why was Keith Rashad your favorite classmate in law school? And second, <laughs> what is the first or most important thing that you find you need to educate a lawyer on when that lawyer is coming in from the outside and working with Indian country for the first time. Well, and I'll note, I did offer an initial response in the chat since I had an op opportunity. Um, and uh, folks can see that there, which, uh, you know, Keith, it was your winning personality, your harmonica skills, you know, it was just across the board. I'm just kidding. I don't know if Keith has harmonica skills. Um, but yeah, to summarize what I said, um, uh, you got to listen a different way, frankly. Um, you're not there. You're not in charge or you're not there to be in charge and direct things. Um, so I, I said a few more things there, but it is a, you know, my experience is, is it really is a different setting um, for an attorney than it is when I'm working with a non-tribal client um, and the expectations of your behavior, uh, just literally behavior are sometimes different. And um, yeah, so I offered a few comments on it to that point, but I'm sure others have, have other thoughts too. Sure. Uh, Keith Rashad was always my favorite because of kindness, uh, sense of humor and humility. He, uh, helped me keep everything in perspective when we were in uh, class together and gave me somebody to, uh, chat with and, and, uh, decompress after class or before. Well, see, now I feel like a jerk. <laughs> uh, I, can, I can tell you the only reason I liked Keith in law school was the Sunday night poker game. <laughs> <laughs> Taking his money. Huh? <laughs> um, I agree with Sarah on advice. Um, and it's very similar to part of my presentation in that the tribe existed before you, the tribe will exist after you. 
you are, have an important role to play, but it's a much smaller role than you may think it is. So <laughs> learn the systems, read the law, meet people, and give advice when asked, participate when asked. Otherwise, just try to blend in. I always feel like it's a success when somebody says, oh, you're an attorney here? Yep. Yes, I am. How long have you been here? <laughs> Five years. <laughs> really? The less you know I exist, the better off. <laughs> I'm just a piece of the machinery. I'm here to help my client reach their goals. I shouldn't be the face everybody sees and knows. Mm -hmm. I'm behind the scenes helping others shine and reach their goals. And that's when I feel the most successful. Amy, do you have anything to add to that? I know you didn't go to law school with Keith, but... Uh, no, I didn't. I <laughs> missed that opportunity. Um, you know, the only thing I would I agree with everything that Dennis and Sarah just said about it. Um, the, the one thing I noticed over time is, especially dealing on contract issues, sometimes lawyers will just you know, they immediately cross out, we're not going to apply tribal law to this contract, and we're not going to agree to dispute resolution in tribal court. And, um, you know, that may well be your client's ultimate position. But I think just rejecting those without out of hand without actually doing research about whether that's a good idea, and doing it in a disrespectful way uh, will not serve you or your client well. Yeah. Well, sir. very good. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Ki Huang Isherwood, I believe. I'm sorry if I butchered your name. It says, question for Judge Hogan. What has the practice of your court been like during the pandemic? Has the court been using video conferencing technology? Any unique social distancing measures? We have been entirely virtual uh, since early March of 2020. And I've done all my hearings by video conference the whole time. I know um, two of the other judges were not excited about having to be on camera. <laughs> and so they did phone hearings for a long time. But I think I've now got all of the judges doing video conferencing. And it's, it's worked out pretty well, um, you know, as well, I think, as it has for other courts. In terms of any additional social distancing, um, it hasn't really been an issue for us because everything has been virtual. Our clerks finally were able to get back in the courtroom, you know, the court building um, in the last couple weeks, they got vaccinated. So they're trying to catch up on filing, but we don't think we'll be doing in-person hearings again until probably fall when we've got everybody for sure vaccinated and hopefully the community is able to open up its community center again. Okay, thank you. Another question is um, a number of tribal courts have trial ju court judges um, who don't have a Western style legal education. Um, what are the benefits and the burdens of that arrangement? Well, I can take the first crack at that. Um, one of the burdens is all that nifty civil procedure we studied in law school, and that is most of the early practice and litigation uh, you can throw out the window. <laughs> that oftentimes is not effective, can be confusing, and can be perceived as trying to play games and not get to the root of the matter. Um, I think the upside of um, not having a Western law trained judge is it tends to be more about equities and storytelling and some of those relationships. Um, so in some ways you get to practice that part of your training is how do you advocate, how do you paint a picture with your words about what happened here and what the right outcome is and not be so structured on procedure, um, which can be a challenge for me personally. And I think for lawyers generally we like structure, we like systems, we like procedures, mm -hmm. we write them, we operate in them all day. So to have to cast those aside and just focus on the storytelling and the equities involved can be a nice shift once you embrace it, but it, it can leave you um, in uncomfortable situations from time to time. Mm -hmm. Particularly when you have a good procedural out <laughs> and you really wanna use it, but uh, mm -hmm. no, it's not gonna be effective. 
Mm. Yeah, I, I think. Oh, oh, go ahead, Vanya. I was just going to say, I think there are some kinds of disputes that lend themselves really well to um, dispute resolution with with a judge who's not law trained. Like, uh, frankly, a lot of the kinds of cases that I hear, the child protection matters, it's not a lot of technical law. It is really understanding family dynamics and trying to get people the help that they need. Um, and I think, um, you know, having people from the community uh, hearing those kind of things can be very helpful. On the other hand, um, you know, I alluded to before a case that I had that was in federal court and tribal court and state court that involved a $50 million bond transaction. And um, the tribe originally had a lay judge that was going to go in front of in tribal court. And we just realized that's not there were, and there were like six different parties. We just thought that's probably not going to work very well. Um, and so ended up building in a provision for a, the tribe to add a, a law trained uh, pro tem judge to hear disputes like that, that really would be worth, you kind of need the procedures. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, I agree completely. There are um, one of the projects that I worked on um, for a number of years was doing through a federal government contract, um, helping lead assessments of tribal courts, voluntary assessments where a tribal court would ask a team to come in, um, assess what's going on, talk to all the parties and shareholders, well, not parties to the cases, but shareholders in the court, whether that was judges or advocates or clerks or elected officials or, you know, child welfare department folks. And um, through that work, got to see dozens of different tribal courts uh, from the inside and just as many different models that people were following. And um, tribes that are able to do wellness courts and peacemaking courts and other practice uh, or other judicial approaches that integrate traditional decision-making concepts and oftentimes non-law trained people as part of um, the whole often have really good outcomes. Uh, it's a really different setting depending on the practice area for sure. But um, where there was a mix, I actually was surprised to understand because I, I have some of those experiences that Dennis was talking about in terms of you know, times when you know, it's, <laughs> you'd like to know and rely on procedure and precedent and, and navigate this as closely as you would, um, and in the similar ways that you would in other um, state or federal court settings. Uh, but surprised to see that there really was a lot of richness um, in some of those different models. So, um, you know, a lot of places, I think, really benefit from having both. Um, I think having no law trained judges is often um, in the long run it, it, on a tribe in a tribal court setting is is really challenging to deal with the, the breadth of issues. And it's also just the reality um, in a number of places in terms of tradition, in terms of financing um, for the court, for any number of other reasons. So. Yeah, if you're doing the work, you got to stay on your toes and be agile. Um, you know, each court is going to be just as different as each tribe. If we have time, I have one more question for Vanya. How often is there a conflict of law between state domestic relations and child protection law and tribal laws on those topics? And also related, does it occur that state and tribal court issue conflicting decisions and how are those resolved? Um. Well, I can't say that I, I can answer for our court um, in terms of the procedure. Our, our code regarding child protection is not as detailed as Minnesota's, but I think the proceedings are fairly similar nonetheless. Um, our hearings are maybe a little bit less formal, but um, you know, in terms of the general standards that we use for determining when to reunify families, um, I think they're pretty similar. We do not do termination of parental rights in our court, so that is one big difference. Um, there are far fewer cases now than there were uh, back when I first started practicing where you have a tribal court and the state court 
on the same track with the same case issuing conflicting decisions. And in part, that's because um, there's a tribal court state court forum that was I helped start uh, many years ago before I was even a judge um, to get tribal court judges and state court judges talking and understanding um, that things work a lot better if we can work together. Um, and so I think that now there are some formal, some informal processes for uh, where state courts will defer to tribal courts when they know the tribe wants to exercise jurisdiction in a particular you know, child protection kind of setting. Thank you. Well, I hope that's been uh, interesting and maybe even a little enlightening. Um, I appreciate everyone who attended today. I appreciate the three panelists. That was very good, very informative. And um, thank you all very much.